This week's episode of The Horror Show with Brian Keene is brought to you by the horror experts at The Bold Mom. The Bold Mom is the place for readers to discover the most disturbing horror material and for authors and small presses to find help and support for the promotion of their books. The Bold Mom works with many magazines, podcasts, radio programs, filmmakers, bloggers, and other websites to bring the best of the best to their audience. If you're looking for horror, look no further than Mar and her staff at The Bold Mom. Visit them at theboldmom.com. It rhymes. Theboldmom.com. B-O-L-D-M-O-M. Uh, also on Facebook and Twitter at The Bold Mom. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- what part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment! The f- Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Once again, to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network and available for free on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, and all other platforms. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting our network and keeping them alive another month. You can do that at projectentertainmentnetwork.com. If it sounds like I'm rushing through the opening credits, that's because I am. We're off to a very late start today because I was on a conference call where I was told that Thor was nothing more than George Carlin with a hammer. I don't know that I've ever disagreed with a statement more than that, but anyway, now I am late to pick up Dungeon Master 77.1 from school. So without further ado, over here at the center of the room, Mr. Excitement himself, Dave Thomas, next to him, Professor Mary San Giovanni, and next to her, Matt Daddy Lion Wilson. Hi. <laughs> I'm scared. Send help. <laughs> I need the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, one more time, thanks to the Bold Mom for sponsoring this week's show. We'll see you next week, folks. Bye. Thanks. Really? <laughs> Could we do it like that? Yeah, yeah. that would so. be great. I don't know. If you want, no. Okay, no, we can't. That'll be the one to get like I think five. Matt, no, that would be, that'll be the episode to get like fifty thousand downloads. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, he shut the hell it's up. It's literally a ten-second episode. <laughs> Matt, you're you're a, you're a comic book guy. Yeah. You you used to work as a comic book retailer, I Dave. Did. You're a comic book guy. You've been reading since the Silver Age, since mm-hmm. before Matterai. When you think of Thor, do you think of George Carlin with a hammer? No. <laughs> no, I, I actually... I'm not a comic book person, and I don't think of George Carlin with a hammer. I actually I don't of think of a single character as George Carlin no. with any... Uh, wielding no. anything. <laughs> no. No. Anyway... Yeah, this project's fun. Um, you know what else was fun? The White Rose Comic Con. Mary and I went to that last weekend. You know what? We did. I gotta say, the it was it was in fact sparsely attended. Um, there was a train show in the same building. I've heard this. Yeah. So there were a lot of a lot of old guys in their seventies and eighties wandering in looking for the train show with their little conductor um, hats. You know, it would have helped if there had been Choo-choo. a simple banner. <laughs> A banner outside, or sign. even just a sign yeah. saying "comic show here." Right, yeah. uh, but despite the sparse attendance, our fans turned out in force, uh, and every author that was there made money. Yes, um, I know Jim Steranko made some money. I, I don't know about the Village People and and uh, Cowardly the Dog and and all them. I uh, I believe that's Courage the Cowardly Courage Dog. Courage the Cowardly Dog. Uh, but One of the greatest cartoons ever. Yeah, I, our, <laughs> our, our folks made money. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we met some really cool people. Met some really cool fans. Uh, you know, they, I mean, they, they, they came to see us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how the other vendors, I mean, I talked to some of the vendors. Uh, some of them were happy. I, I think everybody agreed that, you know, some signage and some promotion would have been good. I'm told yeah. that the show bought ads in Baltimore, radio spots in Baltimore. I don't know 
why someone in Baltimore who has Baltimore Comic Con is going to drive to to yeah. bumfuck Pennsylvania for mm-hmm. you know, but I I don't know. Uh, I I I don't know if they'll do it again or not. I, I don't know if they if it was a financial success for them, but I I know that those of us who were there we we did do okay i think you know what i think there should be and i don't mean this in a snarky or nasty way i mean i i mean this as a genuine altruistic thing there ought to be something ideally written by uh people who've run conventions or people who you know or guests who've attended or in brian Keene's case both um that gives like a basic 101 of things that like a handbook. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, this is what you should do with your guests. This is what you should do with your floor plan. This is what you should do with your vendor. This is when you should start. This is the schedule of when you should be doing all these things to make a convention. I work. know that before his untimely death, that Mike Roden, mm-hmm. of course, the, the founder of the Horrifying Weekend, he had talked with me numerous times about he wanted to write a book like that. I think it'd be... And, you know, uh, he'd, really he'd ask me, he said, you know, would, would you give me a hand? Would you look it over? I said, absolutely. I think you'd be the guy to do it. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't know that Mike ever got past the planning stages, the, the thinking right. about it stages. Right. I don't know um, if there's a book, but if you type how to run a convention into Google, you get tons of hits. Yeah, but so. how many of those are, but, are knowledgeable? It, well, right. You know, you, you got exactly. Them, That's but. the problem. Everybody thinks they know how to run a convention. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, you know, kudos, uh, you know, I will, I will say Carl, uh, Carl was, uh, one of the investors and I, and I thought Carl did a, a very good job of balancing <laughs> the needs of many. Yes, he did. Um, he, did. he kept coming around to check on us, which I thought yeah, was very cool. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the, the actual founder, the, 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 the guy running the convention, I, I, I think we spoke to him once and I don't think he knew who we were, um. You know, but I, I guess he had other things going on. Uh, we apologize to those who showed up on Saturday looking for our panel. We were also looking for it, um, and we're still looking for it. <laughs> we, we may have misplaced it. It's lost somewhere. in the yeah. ether. <laughs> we're not. We're not sure what happened there. We were told we had a panel, but then we didn't. Um, Robert Ford tried to get to the bottom of it and had no luck. No. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Thanks to those who came out. Um, thanks to the fans that came out. While we were there, uh, Lucas Lucas Mangum came all the way from Texas. He did. Uh, so Holy we, shit. yeah, so we <laughs> we interviewed him, uh, and that's coming up later on the show. And uh, it has a guest appearance by Wesley Southard. That's right. Um, the two of them talk about many things, including uh, the recent Deadite Press controversy. They are both, of course, Deadite Press authors, um, and they're going to talk about that. Um, something else coming up here in a few weeks: Jeff Burke. Uh, until recently, of Deadite Press, his second appearance on this show, uh, and he's he's going to talk to us. We're going to be the first mm-hmm. for him to break his silence on that whole situation. Um, so that'll be coming up here in a few weeks, or as soon as Dave can give me a technological answer of how to make it happen without spending the money to fly <laughs> Jeff here to the East Coast. Um, <laughs> Before we get all of that, though, uh, a bunch of sad news this week, and yeah. then what I think will be a really funny bit. Okay, so let's start with, uh, first of all, Larry Cohen. Producer, director, and screenwriter Larry Cohen died earlier this week at the age of 82. Um, his name should not be unknown to any fan right. of classic horror cinema. Uh, you know, he got his start in 19, 1958 by writing a TV adaptation of Ed McBain's crime novel, the 87th Precinct. Um, what I found interesting, horror fans, of course, know Larry David for It's Alive right, and the right. stuff. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Crime fans know him, of course, for, you know, the, the black exploitation genre, Hell Up in Harlem, Little Caesar, you know, stuff like that, um, and the 87th Precinct. Mm-hmm. Uh, so two very distinct audiences. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, a lot of his horror had a police procedural uh, segment to it. You, you think back to Q. Everybody here seen right, Q, right. the giant winged monster movie. I have to admit, I have never seen it. Seen I am it. probably one of yeah. the only people on the planet who hasn't you know, seen Q it. Q is is basically it, it's like a god. It's a it's, it's a, a kaiju yeah, movie. A yeah, kaiju it, movie. this yeah. giant winged serpent that makes its nest at the top of the, the Empire State Building. I'd like but to there's see. a whole police procedural subplot right. in in the in the the whole movie, which kind of elevates it a little bit. So does It's Alive, if I remember correctly. It's, it's Alive as well. It has, it has so, yeah. a, a component of that. Yes, yeah. it does. 
So yeah, anyway, you know, he got his start uh, adapting Ed McBain for television. Over the next decade, he did episodes of Zane Grey Theater, Surfside 6, which I only know Surfside 6 from Family Guy. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever seen an episode of it. Family Guy, in uh, which he know. does culturally every episode. He usually grabs for everybody. Yeah, he, he wrote for The Fugitive, he wrote for The Defenders. That's um, awesome. However, what put him on the map originally was 1967, the year I was born. Uh, he thought about two of his favorite movies, Invaders from Mars and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and he created a television show called The Invaders. Now, it only ran two seasons, but it's got a huge cult status. It paved the way for such shows as V mm -hmm. and uh, The X-Files, etc. Alienation. Alienation. Yep. Of course, as we said, he was best known for his horror movies, the It's Alive series, the Maniac Cop series, the I love Maniac yeah. Cop. <laughs> Q, the oh stuff, <laughs> the stuff, which we could yeah. do a whole show just on the stuff. Uh, God told me to, which I think is very underrated. Special effects, a return to Salem's Lot, Full Moon High, and of course the Masters of Horror episode, Pick Me Up, which was an adaptation of our friend David Scal's oh, short I love story. That. Yeah, I love that one. Um, I mean, yeah, the stuff. You know, that was a movie about products being sold legally in yeah. a retail market that would kill you. You know, back then, a lot of people thought it was an analogy for cigarettes. These days, it could be an analogy for Roundup Weed Killer or any one of these yeah. fucking medicines you see. Talcum powder. Propecia is not for everyone. Uh, may cause lymphoma, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Homicidal hallucinations. Yeah, you know. Well, and then you think, you think back then, like, the stuff, it was like that pink goo. Right. Or whatever. And now you see pictures of today where it's like... Here's this pink shit that they mix in with ground beef to stretch it. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. oh, it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually happening, you know. and I can't do anything about it. <laughs> uh, Dave, were you an Andy Kaufman fan back in the day? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so I'm sure you've seen God God Told Me To, right? I have, but I don't, I don't remember. That before. was, yeah. if, if I remember correctly, that was Andy Kaufman's film debut. I I think, I think so. you're right. Yeah, a, a small yeah. part in that. Yeah, um, a small part of that. I think, I mean, you know, look, It's Alive terrified me as a kid. And I didn't even see the movie as a kid. I just saw photographs of it in, like, Fangoria. Yeah, yeah. And it scared oh, yeah. the shit out of me. Yeah. Just just the evil babies. I saw it I but, saw it at a sleepover. And, yeah, 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 it It's Alive is, is you know, a great, great um, movie. But I, I think, and the stuff, like I said, it's it iconic. Like, but yeah. I, I think God Told Me To is his most underrated film. I would um, agree with that. Yeah, you know. I mean, I I do love the Maniac Cops here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's not. just a certain thorn yeah. thing about it it's where you're like, not to like this. You this is I mean? this is almost trauma, but a little yeah. bit better right. production, <laughs> and it's just like. And, and Campbell was in that. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Was. I thought yep. he was. I yeah. think that was before. No, was that before Evil Dead or no? No, no, no that, that was after. That was after. 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 Yeah, yeah. Exactly. but he still looks like a little kid. Oh yeah. In Maniac Cop. Yeah. So yeah, uh, age of eighty two. Very long, stellar, you know, Very seminal career, career. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I never got to meet him, but I we have a lot of mutual friends, and uh, my condolences to all of them. Um, also, earlier this week, uh, when when we are recording this, it just happened yesterday. You folks will hear about it later in the week. Uh, Day of the Dead's Joe Pilato passed away in his sleep at the age of seventy. Uh, you know. He played Captain Rhodes in 1985's Day of the Dead. Um, you know, at the time, it was the, the final film in George Romero's trilogy before George came back and made a couple more in the series. But, you know, it, uh, Captain Rhodes, one of the most iconic scenery-chewing <laughs> roles ever in, in modern horror cinema. Absolutely. I mean, it ranks up there with Campbell and Bruce of the Dead. No, I'm just... Or, I'm, uh, uh, Evil Dead, I mean. I'm Bruce horrible the with... Dead. Uh, <laughs> I'm horrible with names and placing faces. He was the one that got ripped in half. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that yeah. iconic I had a scene, feeling that's you know, who it was. That, 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 I mean, how many times have we seen that scene replicated in, in everything from yeah. Family oh, Guy yeah. to, you know, everywhere? Choke on him! Choke on yeah. him! Well, I just <laughs> even love that scene where they're all just basically... They're sitting at two tables... And they just start getting an argument, and he just draws his gun out. He's like, "Sit down," yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. And everybody's just like, "Okay, okay, <laughs> this guy's fucking crazy." <laughs> I'm running this monkey lab, yeah. Frankenstein. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, to have that iconic role alone, and, and you know, he never 
quite achieved that fame again as an actor, but he no. did have roles uh, in the original Dawn of the Dead. Uh-huh. Before Day of the Dead, he was one of the yeah. cops. You know when they're oh. when they're when they're bugging out to the mall and oh, they're there yeah. at the boat dock. I didn't know that yeah, little fun fact. That's cops. cool. I didn't know that. Thing. Uh, he was in Night Riders. Um, mm-hmm. He was in Pulp Fiction, Alienator, Empire of the Dark. Oh my God! He Night of the Living Fiction. Dead, Origins yeah, yeah, 3D, yeah, and Matt. I know you saw this one, Digimon, the movie. <laughs> Digimon. <laughs> he did a lot of uh, voices. Did right? a lot, a of, lot voices. of voices. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Star. Star Trek, Starfleet Academy, Might and Magic, uh, Warhawk, Red Mercury, a whole bunch more. Hmm. Uh, his last role, I believe, was 2018's Shh. No, I'm not shushing you, Mary. That's the title of the movie. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I said I never got to meet Larry Cohen. I, I did get to meet Joe Pilato, interacted with him at numerous conventions. That's cool. Um, I mean... The guy was a riot. Yeah, yeah. he was fun. He I was... mean, if, if you were at a convention with Joe Pilato, you're gonna good time. It, it didn't huh. matter if you were at Dragon Con or White Rose Comic Con. You were gonna have a good time yeah, either way. Yep. Yeah, no, um, that's he awesome. was really cool. Yeah, I, I think my favorite, favorite <laughs> Joe Pilato memory. I don't know if I've ever told this one on the air or not. We were at a convention in Phoenix, Arizona, and it was a terrible. <laughs> Convention. It was, it was. It was a con where they had. <laughs> I love that she's already laughing yeah. before you even get no. the story out. I they, think I know what they had. Is. I mean, it was. A, it was. The lineup was great. They had actors. They had authors. They they had a complete Day of the Dead reunion. You know, so it's it's Gary Clark and Joe and everybody, um, and and you had like Tom Piccarelli and myself, but it was, it was so sparsely attended. It made White Rose Comic Con look like Dragon Con, attendance wise. Holy shit. Um. I mean, John Skip, who at that time had just launched his comeback. You know, he'd been gone for a decade. Right. Launched his comeback. He read to an empty room. He had a reading, and they booked him in, like, this this really huge conference room. And I, I go walking by, because I was on the way to get uh, Tom Piccarelli and I some cigars to smoke by the pool, because that's what we spent the weekend doing. <laughs> and, and I walk by, and I hear Skip reading, and I'm like, oh, fuck, that's right. It, it's Skip's reading. And I go in. And it's empty. There's not even like, you know, that one person that right, shows up. Right. It's empty. But and, you know and he stops in mid sentence. And he looks yeah. up and he says, Hey man. I said, Skip, what are you doing? He says, I'm doing my reading. And I said, But there's nobody here. He goes, I know, but people may come in and I want them to think they missed something. Good for you, Skip. That's good. I mean good that's quintessential you. John Skip right and there. That, and I, and there, that, there's a there is a gentlemanly Professionalism yeah. and got, a surreal you got right. screw you ism to that, yeah. all in the yeah. same. That, you that's, know. that's like brilliant. <laughs> that that sets the tone for this convention. Yes, which is why I loved it on Sunday morning when Joe Pilato, who had been up drinking with all of us the night before, <laughs> you know, uh, I, and I remember that party. It was uh, Tom Pick, really, myself, Coop, mm-hmm. our, our our dear friend Coop, uh, Todd Clark. Um, and then actors. You had Reggie Bannister from Phantasm, Michael Berryman from uh, Hills Have Eyes and Weird Science. And, and Joe was one of the group up there. And we all went to bed at some point. But I guess Joe stayed up. <laughs> and the next morning, the hotel's doing, like, brunch. So you got you got the horror fans stumbling around. But then you got, like, the Sunday brunch crowd coming to the hotel. <laughs> and there's this, this fucking grand piano in the hotel lobby <laughs> yeah. right oh, next shit. to the brunch people. And here comes Joe Pilato with a bottle of booze. <laughs> Hasn't slept. Wearing, wearing a white hotel bathrobe. Yep. <laughs> That's white, what makes the yeah, story. White fuzzy hotel slippers. Oh. This is what makes the story. And he's... It's here comes Captain Rhodes from Day of the Dead. <laughs> and he sits down at the fucking piano in the lobby and just starts just playing. Now I knew I knew I knew he he was a musician. I, like at one time he wanted to be a lawyer. He okay. wanted to be an attorney, but instead he got into acting. Imagine Captain Rhodes wow. as your attorney in court. Holy shit. I'm running this monkey show, Frankenstein. You're out of order. Sit you know? down. You sit down. I rest he just pulls my gun in court. <laughs> sit down. Put the gavel down. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, he, I don't I don't know if he was trained on piano, but well, I didn't recognize the tune, but it was beautiful. Yeah. It was beautiful. And then somebody told him he had to stop and he fucking went off on him. <laughs> and and it was I'm very running clear. this brunch. Yeah. 
it was very clear this this hotel staffer had no idea. You know, it's Joe Pilato. But it God. just it was so goddamn funny. And he didn't he meant no harm. Right. I right. mean, you know, that's just it's, he was like Harz William Shatner before Bruce, <laughs> before Bruce Campbell became Harz William Shatner. Right. Yeah. Right. We had Joe Pilato. Um he was just he was a he was a fun guy to be in the room yes. with. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I, lots of mutual friends, uh, you know, Ken and everybody else, my condolences to all of you. So you, did, Mary, did you ever get to meet him? Yeah, I met, I met him. In Baltimore or Gettysburg? Uh, horror fine, I met yeah. him, I think. Um, we went to that party, uh, I think that, <laughs> the infamous Dallas party that Dallas invited a lot of people under your Oh name. yeah, the one where Ketchum got 21 young ladies into the yes. party under my name. I was one of them. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I met Joe there, and I met Joe one other time. Yeah. He was, yeah, he was very nice. Yeah, he just, you know. Yeah, it was, Dave, it was you, fun. you never met him, did you? No, I did. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah, do you have a good Joe Pilato story? I, I, I don't have a good story. Did he either. sign, offer to sign your, your ass or anything like that? No, no, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't oh, the days of body part yeah, signing. I, no. No, he asses. just he was he was a ton of fun. I, when I go to conventions, I like to watch, especially the actors interact with people. Yeah, because yeah. there's some that are really good with it, and they're really good with their fans, and there's some that are douchebags. Right. And I always think, why are you being a douchebag? You know. Right. right. These yeah. are the people. These, these are, are the people that are famous. Yeah. Why you're famous? You should be. You know, even if you don't feel like being here, be nice. You're an mm -hmm. actor. Right. Act for a couple hours. This guy was genuine. He was super nice. He would talk to anybody that came to his table. Whether you bought something or not, he would talk mm -hmm. to you, you know. Mm -hmm. right. And I swear to God, I went to dinner with him in one of these massive group dinners that we used to do all the time at the conventions. Right. But I couldn't tell you where it was or why. Or the, but but he, I remember just him talking and telling stories. I and, think, yeah, we did go to dinner once. Yeah. And I think you were with us. I were, I was you, and, you, you and Big Joe and Tomo, I yeah, believe, yeah, I were my so. guests. We're, yeah, we went yeah. with you. And he was one of the people. And he's just telling stories, and he's fucking hysterical. Yeah, yep. it's one of those things where you just sit there and listen to the stories. You don't talk because right. like, you interrupt. Like, but <laughs> you, wanna, you sit down. Well, he's, <laughs> it's one of those guys who would tell a story, and then as soon as you tell a story, you think of another story related to that story, that kind of thing. Oh, right, was, right. It, it was just it was like steamrolling. So I'm just sitting there like, I'm entertained. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was really, really cool. I, I, I typically don't talk to actors and directors unless it's somebody I know because I don't want to bother people like, right. who the fuck wants to talk to me right. like you guys are in this room you don't want to talk to me Oh, <laughs> shut up you do it for force <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Stop. I, again I, I always appreciate somebody who, who's generally nice and appreciates yeah. their fans Yeah, and I really get pissed off at, at actors and especially musicians I hate musicians that think they're important you know, it's like really you could take five minutes to talk to this person. You're yeah, like, just right. you know, he bought your album. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. give him some time. So I don't think a lot of times people realize. And I saw an essay about this the other day about what people mean to other people. You know, right. like you don't realize like you, you wrote a book or you recorded music that really resonated with somebody at a certain point in their life. Right, mm -hmm. and they sometimes they just want to tell you that story. Yeah, you know? yeah, and, and I I think that's you know, and and it's like I. I generally appreciate like anybody we go to conventions. Anybody comes up to me and says, you know, oh, I love this episode of Hard Show. Like there was a guy I, I remember telling a story, and I don't remember what exactly had happened to him, but he was in a hospital, and he said, I started with episode one. Yes, and I, I remember listened. That guy. Oh, I remember wow. him. Yes, so, I do. Yeah, I listened to the entire run, and I have to think. And, and I, I, he told this to me. I'm sure he said it to you guys too. Um, you know, he said, I can't tell you how much it meant to have your guys' voices in my head every day. That's awesome. You know? And so you hear a story like that, you're like, it, it, it's, it's, you can, how do you know how to react to that? Yeah, you know? right, and, right. And I can't, you know, like I said, I, I unfortunately, I, don't, I, well, I wouldn't say his name in the area anyway, because he was in the hospital. Like, yeah, people might not want to know about mm -hmm. that. But, right. but, you know, you hear a story like that. So you take somebody who's like in something like Day of the Dead or Dawn of the Dead or something, a hundred times, you know, are going to be people that are going to say, you know, I was having a really shitty time in my life, but I saw your movie and you really entertained me, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, I always get frustrated when people are jerks to, like, to right. something yeah. like that. Or like they blow right. them off or like they're only there to pick up women or, you know. Right. Especially we, if it's like something where you can tell that the, like, that this person, you know, their whole life trajectory right. is because of this movie. Right. Or because or of this, you know. It's something that, that it came along in their life yes. that, that, like, really helped them for whatever exactly. reason. Like, we helped this guy in a hospital. We gave him something to listen to. Right. Like he's laying in a bed recovering from whatever had happened to him. You know? Like, I always think of Lombardo talking about the time his dad took him to the uh, the horror convention. Yeah. 
and the special effects guy gave him like was was showing him how to do all this stuff yeah. and gave him like a little bag of supplies. Right. And look that, where Mike that, is now. Yeah, you know? it changed yeah, his yeah, life. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So anyway, that's my story, and I'll be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then. All right. Well, that was a hell of a day, new mom. It was like hearing somebody like play a, a, a brilliant like violin, and it's like, and that's all you get. And see. Well, that's, yeah. and see. I, was over, I, I was over here looking something up on the phone. I'm thinking, this is great. Dave's Dave's filling in for me. <laughs> and, like, uh, and, now yeah, yeah, yeah. and now I'm done. Well, I figured he's looking as funny as so he's bored. So I, 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 you know what, though? I, so, so much of my life with Brian... Is him looking at something on his phone, and I used to think the same thing too. I used to think like, "Am I so boring that you'd rather be, you know, playing around on your phone?" But I, I think that his brain is just constantly going so, you know, in so many different directions at once. Well, that if he we're, needs, if we're gonna have a you know, phone contest. He's gonna lose to Phoebe because <laughs> no one, no one spends more time on their phone looking at stupid shit. I'm and just you know multitasking. What, and then he's multi- so I, I was, I was looking up. If there were any photos of Joe Pilato and I online, oh, uh, but oh. Google's not finding any. Funny. No. So I know I have some, but I, sure I, I, I don't think they're scanned in online. I think I have them in there in my Footlock. I so mind. wish so. there was a picture of him in his bathrobe and fuzzy slippers playing the piano. That would be awesome. I I, I almost that was before certain cell phone, before we really all had yeah. cell phones that did yeah. that, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm almost certain I have a an actual photograph of me and him and. Uh, Gary, the guy who played Steel, yeah, yeah. Um, who's also fucking awesome. The two of them together are just a fucking riot. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, so our condolences to, to Joe Pilato's yeah. loved ones. Um, let's go to happier news. Let's talk about yeah, Skynet yeah, 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 yeah. and how Skynet is just about ready to take us all over. Okay, um, <laughs> Yay! No, we had, we had talked about this. Resistance is futile. We had talked about this on one of last year's episodes. Um there was a, a bunch of stuff in the news about an artificial intelligence that could produce all by itself plausible news stories, short stories, fiction. It, it, it was basically an artificial intelligence writer. Okay? So it's not a robot at the car factory taking jobs. It's a robot taking our fucking jobs. See, like, um, we need anything else to make us obsolete. Yeah, it was the brainchild of a, a group, a nonprofit group called OpenAI who are backed by Elon Musk and other tech entrepreneurs. Um, I know it's very fashionable for folks to hate on Elon Musk. You won't hear me doing that. I actually, I love yeah, Elon I, I think, I think I, Elon yeah, Musk I don't, is like the Tony Stark I, of real life. Yeah, I don't agree with everything he does, but uh, I think we need more risk takers like well, him. the dude literally just wants to invent. That's yeah, all he yeah. really wants to fucking do. Yeah, I like, think you that's kind of admirable. Um, well, uh, The Guardian reported that the creators of this AI, which was called GPT-2. Okay, remember that, GPT-2. They decided that it was too dangerous for them to release into the wild because, (laughs) quote, they said, they said, it is too dangerous for us to release into the wild because it could be employed to create deep fakes for text. Due to our concerns about malicious applications of the technology, we are not releasing the trained model. So they built this AI, realized they had in fact created Skynet, <laughs> and decided, okay, yeah, we can't turn this thing loose. We're gonna see, we're gonna see GPT two manifestos coming along the internet. We can't release it. It's, it's just like yeah. I got a picture in my head. It's like Chappy the robot just chained in a basement somewhere now. <laughs> right. It just does too good of a job. So, so, so oh. Stephen Poole at The Guardian, he's one of my favorite writers at The Guardian. I fucking love The Guardian. They're like the only news source I still really trust. I gotta tell you, um, they're one of the few new, news sources I ever actually read because yeah. I don't really read news. Well, you guys don't trust the Huffington Post. I'm sorry. <laughs> they, I mean, the Huffington Post has interviewed me. They're good for selling books, but yeah. Well, I mean, you're alive. Yeah, I'll believe yeah, that um, one then. Um, <laughs> I think it's cute that they call them the Huff Post. Yeah, but so Stephen Poole decided, you know, Let's test this thing out. He got access to GPT-2. I also got access to it. Disclaimer. Oh, God. Um, There's no way this can go wrong. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> I've seen this movie. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Poole wondered, are machine learning entities going to be the new weapons of information terrorism, or will they just put mid-list novelists out of business? And, well, neither and here, way sounds good. Well, here's what he did, Okay. <laughs> He uh, mm-hmm. he mm. fed it the opening lines of several famous novels, 
and the AI then wrote the next passage. Okay, so like, okay, let's use uh, Skip Inspector's animals. There was something wet and red and dead in the middle of the road. That's the opening sentence from Animals. Right. The AI then picked up from there and continued the novel. Okay, so uh, I thought it would be fun to test this further. There, there's a version of GPT-2 that the press can get their hands on. Steve Poole got his hand on it. Okay. As a representative of the horror show of Brian Keene, I was able to get my hands on it. Naturally. Um, Naturally. For scientific purposes. Yeah. So what we did here, we're going to pit GPT-2 dun, dun, dun. against S.T. Yoshi. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Dave talking about me on my phone. His phone's over there buzzing. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, some doctor wants to buy me. Is that GPT two? Nah, it's a doctor. Okay. So, we, uh, so, so you're so with understand. you're with me here, Dave. Mm-hmm. We're we're pitting ST Yoshi mm-hmm. against GPT two. Seems like an unfair fight. But, and uh, GTP two two. <laughs> um, theoretically, the reason it's dangerous is because it can, in fact, take that one line and extrapolate. The exact text that that it's, the first line comes from is that the no 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 it makes it takes it oh, it, it takes it you give it the first sentence <laughs> and then it writes the rest of the yeah, novel for yeah. you on its own yeah it makes it the text. it so does like, you could literally just go in there give it a first line and it yeah. finishes yeah. the book yeah. for it you. does exactly what you do but faster yeah. and without so many naps in yeah. between oh yeah yeah I don't <laughs> like so this plan at all all right <laughs> so all right here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to read the opening sentences of some famous novels. All right. Then I'm going to read two passages of text. One of them will be GPT-2's contribution. The other is a passage from S.T. Yoshi. You guys decide who wrote which one. (laughs) Ready? Okay. Okay. Opening line of George Orwell's 1984. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. Okay, that's the opening sentence. Okay. All right. All right. A. It was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. I was in my car on my way to a new job in Seattle. I put the gas in, put the key in, and then I let it run. I just imagined what the day would be like a hundred years from now. In 2045, I was a teacher in some school in a poor part of rural China. I started with Chinese history and a history of science. Or B. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13 here in Seattle, where we are dealing with an unprecedented succession of snowstorms that have paralyzed the city. I myself have had to shovel snow on several consecutive days, and I doubt that I have shoveled more than four times total in all the years I have lived in this otherwise temperate city. Driving is incredibly treacherous, especially for those of us who live on side streets that have no hope of getting plowed by the meager resources this city has. For such a purpose. Okay, Mary's yeah, got her hand okay. Yeah. A is written by the computer. B is written by Yoshi. Joshi. Now, what makes you say that? Because both of them apparently set 1984 in the city of Seattle. Well, my reasoning is that from an experienced writer's point of view, if you look at the word choice of A, it's fairly... Um, I don't want to say bland, but there's it, it's choosing words that don't have a lot of connotative meaning other than what the word actually means. Okay. Which I think is something that um, an AI, I, I don't know if an AI is capable of learning, but it's something that writers take years and years and years to learn to find the nuances of a word as opposed to the actual definition of it. So it's fairly straightforward. It's almost like it's not taking any risks. Um, B, on the other hand, uses the kind of multisyllabic language that Joshi tends to favor, as well as a kind of inherent undercurrent of arrogance that suggests <laughs> that he shouldn't have to ever shovel snow. Um, and that the if weather, only there were an AI to shovel snow for him. Exactly. And that the weather is somehow conspiring against him in making it difficult for him to have to live in this otherwise temperate environment. Okay, you are correct. Woo! Uh, Yay! Yep. So one point for Mary. Okay. Second question. Opening phrase of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged. All right. A. It is a truth universally acknowledged that when a nation is in a condition of civilization, 
that it is in a great measure the business of its leaders to encourage the habits of virtue and of industry and of good order among its people. Or B, it is a truth universally acknowledged that using like for as or as if is one of the most common solecisms today. And it has been increasing in usage for at least a century. But the fact that it is now widespread to the point of near universality doesn't make it any less, less of a solipsism that it is a prime instance of a corruption gaining force because of ignorance of the proper use of these words. Dandelion. Go for Matt, this you one. had your hand up first. Uh, I was going B is computer. B is the computer. Very good. Yes. One point for Mary, one point for Matt. <laughs> Fun pooter. We have two more choices. <laughs> Jesus, that... Is... As and or like and or... <laughs> that, that as to Yossi passage left me short of breath here. Okay. You know, here's the thing, though. <laughs> that was a fact. Joshi has an, a whole thing on like and as and, and why they're wrong and why people use them wrong. Right. Well, uh, these are his quotes that I'm using, so... <laughs> All right. So as I said, Stephen Poole was the writer of this Guardian article. He fed the downloadable version of GPT-2 the opening lines of his article. Okay? Now, the opening lines of the article were this. Will androids write novels about electric sheep? The dream or nightmare of totally machine-generated prose seem to have come one step closer with the recent announcement of an artificial intelligence that could produce all by itself plausible news stories or fiction. Here are your choices, <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna shorten. Yeah, Steve, yeah, yeah. Stephen, I don't know if you listen or not, but I, I'm gonna shorten. Okay. The recent announcement of an artificial intelligence that could produce all by itself plausible news stories or fiction. A lot of great fiction has dealt directly with an entirely new kind of robot. Those whose lives are not as simple as they might like to think they are, who do not seem to know how to perform tasks that are not so simple, but require a little effort and dedication. There can be no substitute for the hard work and perseverance of a robot's mind, but there is a great deal of room in the literature for stories that might be called novel. Or, the recent announcement of an artificial intelligence that could produce all by itself plausible news stories or fiction. One very curious type I devised for myself involved a set of tiny, about two inches high, porcelain figures of all the American presidents from Washington up to Lyndon Johnson. I have no idea how my mother obtained these objects, but they fascinated me from the start. I'm gonna, yeah, I would go with B as Yoshi. Yeah. Dave yeah. is going, okay. Yeah. yeah. One point for each of you. Yeah. That is from Yoshi's memoir. Because the, the the first one was just so fragmented. Can they make, yep. can they make, a, yeah. can they make an uh, AI that can read all the issues memoir in one sitting without dying? Because that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just made it all right. So as I said, I also I also have yes. access to the AI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is bad. I fed it the opening sentence of Nicholas Pichon's <laughs> Insect. Oh, God. Now, this is the tiebreaker. Okay. No hands until I'm done A and B, okay? Because right, I need to right. pay attention. All right. Opening line of Insect by Nicholas Pichon, which is... I wish we had a buzzer. I know, right? <laughs> From this that eludes me, which I pen this, as what I say what eludes me is sleep, and from the sleep becomes the etchings where the dreams begin. <laughs> In them, as they are typed, from the tired fingers I would draw from them in the eyes which sagged on with the thoughts that keep me awake. All right, so there's the opening sentence of Nicholas Pichon's Insect. I have a mark right now. All right. <laughs> this poor AI yeah. probably collapsed and folded it on itself yeah. and divided by zero. A. Do I need to reread the No, the no, we're, okay. no. We're good. A. To paraphrase a query that Ambrose Bierce uttered on numerous occasions, who am I and why? In other words, what is the reason for my existence? I, for one, am having difficulty fathoming this conundrum. Or B, devil bunnies, I snort the nose, Lucifer, banana, banana. <laughs> All right. Matt's got his hand up first now. A, identify... Oh, so now we're adding an extra layer well, to this? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that it's a trick question. Do you think okay. you know which one Yoshi wrote? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. Matt had his hand up first. 
So which one Yoshi wrote? Yeah, which one which one did Yoshi write? Uh, a. A? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I concur. Okay. Yeah, I concur. Do you know who wrote B? Because it was not, in fact, GPT-2. I do not I think know so. Mary thinks Is she knows. Is it Steve Martin? No, it's not Steve Martin, but that's a good guess. Thank you. Steve Martin with a hammer is also not Thor. <laughs> Just from my editor on the Thor project. Uh, yeah. Is it? It is Berkeley Breathed. Oh, uh, yeah. Bloom County. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. okay. The, uh, yes. Bloom County, my favorite comic strip of all time during the basswood masking craze of the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> they get. What is it, Dave? Do you remember? Is it a Lionel Richie album? I think so. Yeah. And they play it backwards. Play it backwards it's no, it's a Pat. It's a Pat Boone Pat record. Boone, yeah. And they play it backwards, and it says, <laughs> "Devil bunnies, I snort the nose." Lucifer, yeah. Banana, banana. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> banana, banana. It's like I knew what that phrase was, but I couldn't remember where it came from. And then now, yeah. yeah. So there you have it. And yeah. now that I have access to the AI, if you enjoyed asshole or AI, please let us know. <laughs> And, and we will play this again. Uh, oh my god! All right, it's time to play asshole or AI. Before we get, <laughs> you should have. What we should have done is fed it first lines from a Jason B. Rock story, and see what. You know, oh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And we can, maybe next time we play, we'll do now, that. And maybe then we should feed we also like, need is an AI where you can feed it Jason B. Rock art. <laughs> and see it comes up with no, just just his cover images. Yeah, that's just his cover design. His cover design. What if we fed it like lyrics, like like Wesley Willis lyrics or something like that? Will it write a song? Okay. You yeah. know, that's a good question. I don't know. Huh. I will reach out to to Steve at the Steve Pool at the Guardian and ask him if he's if, if he's we tried give that. it the beginning lyrics of "I whooped Batman's ass," would it finish it? I was no, thinking I, more I, along Wesley the lines. Wesley Willis's of, biggest hit. I doubt. <laughs> Yeah, I think I don't think you can feed it like the first line of anything, and it's going to replicate it. It's mm-hmm. going to go off on its own. Yeah, that's direction. the thing. It's it's going to create yeah. on its own. It's going to create on its own. You know, I I find this fascinating. Um, it's it's no, it's never going to replace writers. I mean, sure, it might for you know a local regional newspaper or website right, that can't right. afford a staff. Absolutely, but it's not. I could definitely more. see this writing ad copy, doing tech writing in the future. Sure, but it's it, it, it could even replace you know quick churned out pulp fiction you know of the type that the pretenders so to speak are given to write <laughs> but it will never replace a wordsmith like st yoshi well, no, it's, no, no no there, there's only one of those Thank yeah God. <laughs> so, all right let's go to the interview with lucas mangum however before we do that i want to remind you this week's show is brought to you by the bold mom uh Ellie Douglas, author Ellie Douglas, she says uh, the Bold Mom is one of the finest promotional services she has ever used. She says not only did they do exactly what they described, but ten times more. The services they've offered are affordable. Uh, They give you an array of choices. Not only that, but the actual promotional services are done with precision, like a surgeon. Uh, The Bold Mom blew her mind from the get-go with extraordinary measures to showcase her book. Wow. Wow. And uh, Jared Barbie at Death's Head Press, uh, publisher at Death's Head Press, he says that the bold mom sets the bar high for other promotional services out there. When you sign on with them, you are treated like family from day one. They go above and beyond to make you feel as if you are or their, are their only client. Uh, he credits the bold mom with putting his small press on the map. Uh, maybe they can do it for you, too. In fact, I know. They can do it for you, too. You know how I know that? How do you? Because they wisely spent money advertising on this show <laughs> instead of the True. the myriad. Look at that, Yoshi. I used a big word, too. Myriad. Because <laughs> you know he's fucking hate listing right now. Sure. Myriad. I just wanted to say it one more time. Other podcasts out there. No, they advertise on this one that people listen to. Because we do things like assholes and AI. Visit them. <laughs> Visit Mar Garcia and her staff at theboldmom.com. That's the, T-H-E, bold, B-O-L-D, mom, M-O-M, dot com. Uh, Also find them on Facebook and Twitter at The Bold Mom. All right, Lucas Mangum, and then we'll come back on the flip side. Okay, Mary, here we are in probably the strangest place we've ever conducted an interview. 
And yeah. we interviewed Jeff Tate in Queens right in a bathroom at a bar. <laughs> this um, place feels a little bit like we should be in a heist movie. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it, we're, uh, we're in an office with a safe that I have already cracked. An old school <laughs> safe. And yeah. somehow along the way, we picked up uh, Wesley Southern, no stranger to listeners of this show. Uh, but perhaps a stranger in rooms with cinder block walls, unlike you, Brian. Yes. It does look like a police interrogation. Right? It does. I've been in rooms like that. We, be, we should be chained to the table right now. Good cop, bad cop. <laughs> but Wes is not our interviewee. Uh, joining us is uh, the author of Saint Sadist, We Are the Accused, Gods of the Dark Web, Engines of Ruin, Mania, Blood and Brimstone, Flesh of Fire, and many more. Uh, he lives in Austin, Texas with his family, but for some reason, he's here in central Pennsylvania. I am, of course, talking about Lucas Mangum. Hi! This, this hotbed of activities. Glad this is, to yeah. finally have you on. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, or when, I, when I started this show, I told you back then, I don't know if you remember, yeah, man, I want to get you on. Sure, sure, point. yeah. The, mainly, it was just to ask this question, how often in your life that people called you Magnum. Oh, all the man. time. Yeah. All the time. Do you call my Magnum PI? Yeah, my family owns the condom company. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I tell them that's my uh, my porn star name. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I met you here in Pennsylvania. If I remember correctly, I think J.F. Gonzalez and I. Yes. We're doing a signing at the the comic store in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, at that time, you had finished. Your first novel, Flesh and Fire. Uh, Flesh and Fire. Um, at that time, you told me that my stuff was a big influence on it. Having read Flesh and Fire, I would take a guess. Skip Inspector, particularly Animals, was awesome. Fuck yeah, dude, you're on dead on. Like, well, that. yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the the whole the chase. romantic, yeah, the chase That's and the, yeah. the 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 whole romantic element. Romance is not something we see a lot of in horror, especially. Right. You know, it's not hardcore horror, but it, it's not quite. You're not writing Charles L. Grant with that novel. Right. Um, and, and, yeah, I saw a lot of skipping. So I was right, Animals? Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, I read that, um, like, like it, you know, I, I was, like, eight when it came out, so I did not read it when it came out. <laughs> but um, I read it in... Uh, oh, Quartered Parenting. Pro- yeah, right. Probably in, like, 2009, 2010, like, because I... It was on something you posted on your blog about Skip. Right. I don't remember what it was, but it was you said like. Hey, something. children, go reach on Skip. Bro. <laughs> no, it was uh, you know it was uh, mainly you said something about the characters in that in that book. Yeah. And um, and uh, so I read it, um, and then I read it again <laughs> because it was just like so. Um, Captivating, and uh, I really wish the movie had gotten it right. <laughs> um, because, like, I, there's just so much nuance in that book, and and that you know, it just didn't translate to screen. Absolutely, yeah. the nuance. I mean, you know, it's it's absolutely a horror novel, right? But I've always argued you could have labeled that novel paranormal romance. Absolutely. Um, you know, was that? When you started trying to sell the novel, was that a concern of yours? Like, hmm, should I tell people this is a paranormal romance novel? Should I tell them it's a horror novel? Yeah, it was something I thought about, and and I even did like a few tweets like when it came out, calling it that. Um, but yeah, just because I was like, oh, let's see what happens. But I mean, do you think though that you got any resistance because it's paranormal romance and you're a guy? Yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, yeah. and and uh, typically paranormal romance, the protagonist is usually not a uh, it's not is usually not a man either. Right. Um, and right. Uh, and so like there are a lot of things that like you know it definitely does that paranormal romance novels don't do. Um, yeah. So I mean, yeah, that was definitely <laughs> that was definitely something I thought about calling it occasionally, but. And, and I've kind of, like, started calling it that again lately, because I'm yeah. just like, fuck it, I'm just going to call it, you know, what it is. And, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a love story <laughs> with a paranormal element. It's supernatural with balls, yeah. is what it is. Yeah, thank okay. you. Wow, Fair. wow, yes, yes. yes. There's, there's a cover blurb. Supernatural with balls. I, balls. Yeah. Wow. Balls. <laughs> now, when that, when that got published, uh-huh. it's your first novel. Yeah. It gets packaged... As uh, you know, the Mary, you remember the old Ace Doubles, the the flip books that, yes. that Hazen Stein used to be so in oh, yes. It gets packaged with uh, Jonathan Mayberry and Rachel Levin, a novella yeah. by them. Mm-hmm. Your first novel. 
Yeah. Wes, right now you're thinking, that motherfucker. <laughs> So my first novel didn't come out with Mayberry. No, mine was self-published. You know, it uh, it certainly um spoiled me uh, when um, <laughs> sales on my subsequent books <laughs> started coming. In. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> so they didn't buy it because of me. <laughs> well, see, that, see, that's what I wondered because you had that boost. Did it translate to sales for your subsequent books? Like, did Mayberry fans or, or Rachel's fans say, oh? I must remember this guy's name. Uh, you know, some people said that in their Amazon reviews, but... Um, but then they forgot you. I think they did. And, and the thing is, like, I mean, I love Jonathan Mayberry dearly, but I don't think his fans are my fans. Like, I think, especially not for that book. I mean, he's he writes the zombie stuff, and he writes right. the mainstream it's like thrillers. It's action, action. I mean, it's, it's literally, yeah. like, you know, like, stuff that, yeah, it's, yeah. it's action. I did think stylistically, and, you know, look, Jonathan's a dear, dear friend. Yeah. Um... I thought stylistically it was an odd pairing. Yeah. <laughs> it would be like a, a, a flip book with, I don't know, Thomas Ligotti on one side and Richard Lehman on the other. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, just, you know yeah. you want to own that book. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, oh, God. But, you know, Mayberry, I mean, Jonathan, he helped you out when you were getting started, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, he was one of your mentors. Uh, I think oh. you took a class with him when you were still a few. here. Yeah, yeah, a few. Um, a lot of the stories in my collection, Engines of Ruin, were written while I was taking one of his classes. Yeah. 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 Um, so how involved was he with the stories? Like, uh, He would give notes, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, and he, uh, yeah, he would give us notes and... Um, I don't know, he's, for some reason, like, took a liking to me, like, I don't know, I don't know why. <laughs> he's like, John is a very cool guy, though, he really is, yeah, he's I like can, a big teddy bear. I can tell you this, and, and Jonathan, I'm, I'm going to out you right now, <laughs> just like I did in that bathroom in Denver. Oh, <laughs> only, only Mayberry will get that joke. I, we're, we flew out to see Pitt when he had cancer, when right, he got right, out of the hospital, mm -hmm. and we're, we're in the fucking airport in Denver, Colorado, and... Just happen to run into Mayberry of the year. Oh my gosh! Like, he Mayberry. <laughs> <laughs> um, because this I is mean, where all the horror writers. Yeah. Go. All of us, we you know, we pick authors that we think have it, right. that can do this, and we talk about them with each other. Mm -hmm. Even just, if the style's not the just same. like you know, Wes. I, I've talked about Wes with with other writers of my generation. Mayberry has mentioned you by name. Yeah, yeah that's one to watch, you know. So, yeah. That's good to know. Yeah, so obviously you left an impression. I mean, you must have. You contributed to uh, one of the one of the, the viewers. viewers. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's that like? I mean, that's a huge property. Yeah. And as you said, his fans may not necessarily be your fans. I was able to adapt that time, though. Yeah. I mean, it was really, or at least, I mean, he's, he seems to think it, at the time it was my best work, you know. Um, I was, uh, I, uh... I mean, to be honest, like, that particular property had a lot of leniency. It was just like, okay, like, vampires but sci-fi, and, like, you need to set it in a country other than America, and there needs to be a political component. And I was like, okay. And so, like, I, that I can do, and it's got to be 8,000 words, you know? And the first thing I pitched him, he was like, okay, this is a novel. Put that in your back pocket. <laughs> What's the, what's the best piece of writing advice you think he gave you? Oh, that he gave me? Um, uh, definitely, like, kind of uh, know your audience uh, is, 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 is kind of a big, you know, yeah. um, thing. You know, like, know who who you're writing to so, you you know, you know who to kind of... He's a big believer in that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And um, also just, like... Uh, Kind of stay positive. I tend to be a very negative guy, and it's and this business can be, you know, <laughs> negative enough <laughs> sometimes. But uh, you know, he just kind of was the first writer I met that wasn't like this just brooding like Edgar Allan Poe oh, no, type, you know, like yeah. yeah I, 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 wait, that's even my, he also met Jesus and I around this time. Yeah, that's so true. apparently we were brooding Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, yeah. No, I met I met uh, you guys a little yeah. bit after that. Hello, have you met you? <laughs> Yeah. Wes, were we brooding Jesus and I? I didn't know Jesus as well, but yeah, you definitely were. Yeah. <laughs> you were to be fair, I think I met you like right after you had a heart attack, so <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I would have been in a shitty mood then. too. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 So I mean that was your first time playing in someone else's world. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you feel pressure for that? I actually really enjoyed it and like I mean like I would I would like probably sell my soul to write in Aliens or Terminator. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> right. yeah, 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 like, yeah. yeah. Uh, those were like two of my favorite. Like, well, you know, Mayberry next, Aliens and 
anthology you edit, here's two authors, right? Mary, do you want in on that? Uh, absolutely. All right, there's three. I already wrote I feel one like for a xenomorph is my spirit animal. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> I want a little mouth inside the big mouth. <laughs> so, runs <Mountains> forever. <laughs> Can we call the episode that little mouth inside the big mouth? <laughs> <laughs> and as he spit. Is that a family guy skit? Well, that alien loves a predator very much. Hey now, hey now, little mouth. You get back in the mouth. Get back, back inside mouth. me, little mouth. I'll, I'll call you when it's time. <laughs> Oh, God. So you do the sequel to Flesh of Fire. I'm working on it. Right. As you're, a... you're serializing it on your, your website. Yeah. Why go that route? Yeah. <laughs> See, now, unless you can confirm, before we hit record. I know I did. I know I did. And I'm just like, shit. Um, you listen to the show. I know. I know. You know I'm going to dig. There... There is a certain special someone who is not Jonathan Mayberry, who is also involved in this equation, who is also not Rachel Lavin, who is just kind of hard to get along with. <laughs> Say no more. Yes. I believe we that special someone may have been mentioned on this show once or twice. He's, you know, the first time I met him, he was really drunk. And <laughs> And that's fine. I've been really drunk, too. Right, right. And you're a killer con, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he goes, and I, and I introduce myself, you know, the fresh, young, you know, upstart. Like, I'm like, hey, nice to meet you. Thanks so much for, like, you know, like, giving me a book contract. Oh, you're the guy who Jonathan made me take pity on. <gasps> and, um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, no, Dave, no. just in case you can't boost the sound on that, let me repeat that. You have just sold him a book, <laughs> and you go up, you know, that was all done over email. Yeah. You meet him in person, you go up, shake his hand, and he says, quote, oh, you're the guy Mayberry made me take pity on. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, not for nothing. Dick Lehman helped me sell The Rising to Don Daria sure. at Leisure, but Don didn't say that to me. Yeah. And, and look, I do want to clarify, like, he did apologize to me. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Uh, later. Much yeah. later. Because his <laughs> wife told him to. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he made sure to say that in the email. I'm apologizing because my wife said I was a little hard on what you. What the fuck? <laughs> oh. This is a lot of I don't know who this is. Oh, man. What the fuck? <laughs> we'll tell you off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it just, it just really... Rubbed me the wrong way, but like I, I even like was just like, okay, well, it's still an open door. So like I sent them, we are the accused, and this person said, don't send it to me, send it to my assistant, and the assistant like rejected it right away, and I was just like, I thought I have a book with you, like, <laughs> <laughs> not that that entitles me to like right, a, a thing, right. but it's like, I mean, like, I mean, at least like give me some notes or something. I don't know. Right, right. I just like I don't know. It just felt weird. Like, <laughs> so you decided to serialize the sequel. Yeah. Now, will you publish it eventually somewhere other than? I, I'd imagine yeah. so, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I just also just didn't know who, like, I, I like because it was an odd Wait, pairing. stop. Because I don't... The you know what that is? That there's is a the machine gun show. battle going on. Oh, God, yeah. What is that? I believe that's the train show, which is going on concurrently with the show that we are... Because not only are we at the, the <laughs> White Rose Comic Con, which you will hear all about before this interview with Lucas... <laughs> <laughs> The train show is also in the building. And, and most all, people want a party. And all we get along, little 80-year-old men, have been wandering into the comic convention. This is not the train show. <laughs> I've heard, like, seriously. And I've heard, of, cause, because if you go into the ladies' room, um, you can hear the train show sounds. So I've been hearing fart noises and, and squeaky oh, clown noise. <clears throat> Like that? Kind of wow. Like this. Um, yeah. Oh, God. I have opened Guys, we are in a very tiny room. <laughs> I have opened a Pandora's box, which I cannot close. Um, yeah, but I've heard music. I've heard sound effects. I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff. So let's I'm apologizing right now. Jesus. Wow. Box of farts. That's another episode. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, we, my tiny mouth and I'm going to save this interview I, I can do it I can pull it out. so I want to bring us back around sure sure I mean it's, it's very obvious you experiment with different genres yeah. you know I've read most of your stuff um I have 
to, I have to wonder what your influences were growing up because it seems yeah. like you're, you were kind of all over the place. I, I, yeah, I read everything, man. Yeah. I mean, I just, uh, I mean, Saint Sadist is like, I mean, yeah, it's like this gnarly fucking like I don't know how to describe it, but like prose, like stylistically, like I was I was reading Tropic of Cancer and fucking The Sound and the Fury and Paradise Lost, like just like because I was trying to get like a different <laughs> style, like right. you know, just not your right. standard kind of hard style you know I mean I love I love I love the genre but I wanted to try something just a little more I don't know just different what's your first is hard your first love though oh for sure yeah for sure sure. I saw um uh, Stephen King's Silver Bullet um when I was like six years old on Halloween night and I and that was the first time I realized that people write these things like mom my mom said you know there's this guy named Stephen King who made this happen essentially and I was just like that's what I want to do. Yeah. Like, yep. <laughs> it's all your fault, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically, <laughs> what happened to Lucas in fourth grade? Because I do my research. Luke, look at the look on his face. He's like, what how the fuck does Brian Keen know what happened to me in fourth grade? <laughs> I'm because not even you, sure. you, the bat files. In fourth grade. <laughs> in the fourth grade, you were banned from show and tell <laughs> for a I mean, story that you got up and This is and your told life. You. Yeah. That's true. That is true. I uh, it was a story um, in which uh, these kids I forget how they get trapped, but they trapped they get trapped in this haunted house that um, has a clown in it. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> 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 and uh, and the clown may or may not have also turned into a spider. <laughs> Dude, you're talking to the guy who, his senior year in high school, rewrote the mist word yeah. by word by hand because I was in the in school detention. I had yeah. nothing else to do all day. Sure, and they sure. said you're not allowed to read. You have to write something. Fuck you! I'm gonna write the mist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That way I can read it. Um, yeah, and you did. And it's called Darkness on the Edge of Town. <laughs> Oh, shit! It's fired! Coming out of the left field! Um, Making money off that pastiche. Oh, so, fourth grade, it's, 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 it's a clown and a spider, and it disturbed the teacher or the class so bad? Well, uh, there's, there, because I was also really in a Star Wars, like, the, the kid, like, like st- starts getting more in tune with this thing that we might call that was not called the Force, but may as well have been. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets a sword, not a lightsaber, and starts, like, stabbing this spider thing, and, uh, and the, the teacher did not like that at all. <laughs> She wow. said, she said, sit down. <laughs> so what happened when you got home? Was um, this encouraged or was this, oh my God, what uh, did you do? And I said, no, that's, that's, I'm glad you're, you're doing this. Just maybe, maybe keep it here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I got in trouble with one of the nuns that way one time. I was writing out like an outline to a story mm-hmm. and I was passing it to my friend, like a note. And the nun took it away and she read it and she looked at me and she went, Good story. Don't do it during class. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, we we talked about you know you write diverse genres, but even within horror, mm-hmm. you diversify. Um, you know, you, you, I, you you've done some some supernatural stuff. You've done what I would call extreme horror. Sure. Do you have one subgenre that you favor over the others? <sighs> you know, I mean, I really like stuff that kind of. Um, just is just so crazy by the end of it that's just like um uh, there's a story in engines of ruin called video inferno that yes. like yeah yeah i mean like if i could pick like my favorite thing i've done it's that story like i mean now that's almost bizarro i think you know by the end of it yes yeah, yes yeah, yeah it's and, like a real bentley little vibe yeah, yeah yeah no i was uh i had it was rejected from pseudopod but the guy the guy compared me to ramsey campbell and then like but still rejected me which is fine yeah, which right, is you fine. know i wouldn't have read I anything like, past i was like yeah, I was like, oh, thanks. I don't even know if there's a contract attached. You just that's not a rejection. That's a compliment. Yeah, no. I mean, yeah. we've, we're we're like we've been friend, become friends since. You know, yeah. Sean Garrett. I think. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, no. It was just a funny rejection letter. I was like, you just compared me to like one of the greatest. I, I know. I totally fangirl squee about Ramsey Campbell in the ways that like you know people fangirl squee about like rock stars. Sure. Oh, Ramsey Campbell. Yeah. So when you when you moved from Pennsylvania to Texas, I mean, you were pretty involved in the scene. Yeah. The PA. Yeah. Did you find that sort of community in Austin, or? Um, so, 
there are a lot of us in Austin. We right. are just really fucking bad yes. at getting together. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's not like here where you know you uh, traffic is an Amish buggy. I mean, right, Austin right. has like actual fucking traffic. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, Everything in Texas is very large and yeah. far away. Although uh, Shane McKenzie and I are, are pretty good. Um, pretty good friends like our kids play together yeah. and like I mean for a while like during the winter um, you know it was between semesters we were like writing across the table from each other like I was writing Saint Sadist and um, and he was writing uh, you know I, one, one of, of the ones plays. he's not allowed to talk about yeah exactly and, uh, <laughs> and our kids were just like playing in the next room Aww. Uh, yeah it was, it was I, I get these these texts from Shane sometimes a phone call once a month mm-hmm. oh I gotta tell somebody about what I'm working on but you can't tell yeah. anybody yeah Oh yeah, so, no, yeah. He's, uh, he's really doing things, man. Yeah, he you know, is, just, man. He can't talk about it yet. And it's weird because like it seems like he's just disappeared, and it's like no, he's still no. doing stuff. Yeah. It's just he's working harder than any of us. Oh, right now. absolutely, like, he absolutely. Just can't talk Does about. it pay off eventually for Fuck him? Yeah, it pays. Yeah. I mean, but I, yeah. no, but I mean not just financially. I mean, does he get credit for any of these things oh, eventually? Yeah. Or oh yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. So. Let's talk about Gods of the Dark Web. Yeah. Now, you know, you've published Journal Stone, Dead Eye, Grindhouse Press. Gods of the Dark Web was Dead Eye. Uh-huh. Um, how did this, the, the whole thing that happened earlier this year, how did that impact you personally? Like, were you just like, what the fuck is happening? I wasn't at Bizarro Con. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, so... And, and Wes, I mean, uh, it's Lucas's interview... But you also have a novel coming out from Dead Eye. You know, I, I'd like both your perspectives on this. You can speak freely. We've, we've you know, if you've listened to our show. <laughs> to yeah. the 500,000 people that are you listening, know, no I've, I've defended Chandler. Yeah. I, I think him and Jeff made a bad call for the sure. venue. But I adore Jeff. We're going to have Jeff on in a couple weeks. Mary, you didn't even know that till now. Uh, we're going to have an exclusive. But I wasn't yeah. sure. Exclusive did, 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 Oh, nice. You know, uh, we've had Rosalind. I'm friends with everyone involved. Right, and that's what so, makes it hard, right? Yeah, right, um, yeah, right. You know, but I mean, you guys can speak as freely as you want. That's but, right. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, from the perspective of younger, newer authors, yeah. this all has to be very disconcerting. For you, it's right? very disconcerting, and you know, I mean, Rose has always been very kind to me, but I, I've I've found some of the language, you know, uh, the, uh, the communication to some of the dead-eyed authors, just to be a little too vague for my liking. Like, I, I just like. Business as usual for now were, were the exact words used, and that just—I don't know what to make of that. Like, you know what I mean? And you would—you would like an update? Hey, yeah. it's been a couple months. What's, yeah. what's yeah. Who, who is our new editor? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and what does for now mean? Like, right, you know, it's right. like, are you guys changing directions? And you're gonna like. Last what about you? Do you yeah. agree with that? Yo, a hundred percent. Yeah, I'd like a little bit of a little bit more of an update yeah. about what's going on. Kept the mood. Now, Lucas, did you have anything else in the pipeline with Deadlight? Deadlight? So I was working on and still. St- you know, I'm still still kind of playing with it. Um, I was working on a on a dinosaur, a gory dinosaur novel, um, because I know Jeff loves Jeff dinosaurs. Yeah, attack. he's all over that. Um, it's oh. called Extinction Peak, and I was I was like halfway through it when all this shit went down, and I just lost all drive to like oh. work on this thing because I just had so much like emotion, <laughs> like uh, <laughs> emotions over all this, like and uh, and uh, but I but I but I sent it to Jeff. Um, like you know, I, I was like, "Here's half of it. Like maybe like we can like kind of figure out what's working, what's not, or maybe it's all working, and I just need a break because like right. it just was a blow for me, you know. I mean, because I, I I like Jeff a lot, you know, and um, if he wanted it for his new startup, would, oh, you, would you consider that? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, I wrote it for him. Like it was yeah. literally just like we're friends, and like I was, I wanted to write something that I thought he would. Really like, yeah, like. That's cool. <laughs> That's a suburban gothic. The only reason I'm writing it is for Jeff. Yeah, yeah. You know, Lee and I. Thought he's such a good kid, and, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, I I don't know that Jeff knows this. This is one of the reasons Lee finally broke down and wrote White Trash Gothic. Yeah. he's been threatening for a decade. I'm going to do a shared universe, just like the Marvel thing. Yeah, yeah. Lee, that'll never work with your stuff. Well, goddamn, he made it work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is the only reason. And it's one of the more. Yeah, yeah um, the only reason I wanted to do a sequel to Urban Gothic is because I knew Jeff loved. So much. Mm-hmm. Um, Wes, what about you? Because, okay, in Lucas's case, he's got a novel out there, Dead Eye. You sell 
your novel to Deadite, and then all this happens. Do you then panic and say, oh my God, are they going to ban my book too? Not that your book has baby fucking in it. It no. doesn't. But... <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I don't really know how to feel right now about it. I mean, I'm nervous. It's, I'm still waiting for it to go up to pre-order. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know really what to say about it. It's, it's, it's supposed to come out July, June fifteenth. June fifteenth. Yeah. So it probably goes for pre order. I know thirty that, days before. I know that Wrath's their their um, reprint of Succulent Prey is up for pre order right now. That's the April release. Right. And then Christine Morgan's um, Lake House Infernal is up for pre order right now. That's the May release, and then mine's the one after that. Mine's not up yet. Okay. So yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know really what to say about the whole thing. I, I didn't. I, I I'd only talked to Jeff the one time through Skype, and and I had a great conversation with him. And I just I haven't really spoken to him since, other than a few emails here and there. Right. So, I mean, I'm 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 nervous about the whole thing, but I'll feel better once it's out. Well, so basically, what I'm hearing from both of you is you just you would like more communication. Absolutely, yeah. you'd like to be like told. Like some some hey, definitive, here's, my here's book is coming plan. out. Well, yeah, yeah, that's my. I mean, you know, that's like just. Uh, I mean, that's just a sticking point with me, like across the board. Like, I mean, the reason I like working with Grindhouse so much is because Carrie is just very communicative. Right. You know? yeah, right. It's just yeah. I may, I may be secretly writing something with Grindhouse in mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I maybe. Hope so. I, I, Carrie listens to shows. She's going to know that now. Now she's going to be like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I really want to write something with Brian. Yeah, like, no, I, I'm she very impressed me up. with what they're I doing. Just, every time she posts something on Facebook, it just makes me giggle. Yeah. you know, there's some people you look for to, mm-hmm. to just make you smile. Oh, yeah. hers, hers is always funny. Yeah. All right, so Mary, what do you have for Lucas before we head back to this this wonderful convention? You've been oh. signing all day. You're tired. You don't. I uh, know. I wanted to have something brilliant to ask, and honestly, that's okay. No, I mean, I, because it, 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 when early on, when Brian said that it was unusual to have a romance in, because I kind of thought that you wrote extreme bizarro type stuff too. Yeah. But I was going to say, I find that more often in splatterpunk and extreme horror that there's a romance element. Yeah. Than there is in quiet yeah. horror. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I had been curious as to if. If it's considered paranormal romance, and mm-hmm. there's a, a male protagonist, and you're a male writing it, if you met with any kind of resistance, yeah, you I, know, just because it, like, people always ask women the opposite, Right, you know? right, right. Um, but if you haven't, that's kind of cool, yeah. you know, because I feel like that's a good shifting of, definitely, you know. Definitely. Would you do more romance? I mean, do you I, like I, doing I romance? I actually have a straight-up romance, no paranormal, nothing in it. Really? Under, under review with the publisher right now. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's so Now, will cool. you do that under your own name? Probably okay. not. Probably no. not. Just because I don't <laughs> I don't want somebody to read that and then find Gods of Dark Web. <laughs> well, would, you, would you tell your fan base, hey, oh, for sure. my pseudonym? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I probably, yeah, 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 definitely. Well, I mean, Bob definitely. Ford did it and did it successfully. Bob Ford Bob, Ford, yeah. Bob Ford's uh, Chick Lit book yeah. was actually very, very good. He oh, put it out good. under his own name. Right. I think it's sold pretty well for him. So, I think yeah. it's actually one of his better sellers yeah. because yeah. it appeals to people other than just yeah, you know, the hard I, I would have never, I would have never yeah. read it if I didn't know him, but it was it was great. It was a very good book. All right, all right, Lucas. Uh, I guess Saint Sadus is the new one, the new it's, one, right? Yeah. So I had the reissue of Engines of Ruin, We Are the Accused, and Saint Sadus all come out. It's three books in three months. Yeah, I was just saying it's all been within <laughs> yeah, like three so, months. Yeah, so, I mean, so. pick one, grab it. <laughs> Is there any other kind of genre you'd like to write that you haven't written in yet? Oh, gosh. Um, I, uh... I I have this weird affinity for a lot of like the literary stuff that they make you read in school. <laughs> I mean, I would really? like to try my hand like at that someday. Like a Faulkner kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that'd be awesome. All right, cool. I think you can pull it off, dude. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. All right, Dave. I hope you can make all this audible with the the trains in the background <laughs> now, and the echoes of the we, you know, police. We already farted once. Do we want to sign off with? Yeah, let's do that. No, Ready? no, no. Three, two, one. Oh, I got nothing. Oh, shit. This fire. Box of farts. <laughs> Lucas, thank you so much. Dave, back to thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we're back. And one more time, just want to thank this week's sponsor, The Bold Mom, the horror experts. The Bold Mom is the place for readers to discover the most disturbing horror material on the market and a place for authors and publishers to find help and support for the promotion of their books. The Bold Mom works with many magazines, podcasts, radio shows, filmmakers, bloggers, and other websites to bring the best of the best 
to their audience. If you're looking for horror, or if you're looking to promote your horror product, look no further than The Bold Mom. Visit Mar Garcia and her staff at theboldmom.com. You can also find them on Facebook and Twitter at The Bold Mom. We thank them for sponsoring this week's show. If you would like to sponsor a show, there's a really easy way to do that. You want to go to the Project Entertainment Network Dot com. Not the pro yeah, you just want to go to Project Entertainment Network dot com. Um, you want to click contact and you will be put in touch with the CEO of Project Entertainment Network, Armand Rosamelia, and he will come up with a plan that is affordable for you and that will get your product into the minds and hands of our listeners. Um, Mary. Yes. Have you picked a Ramsey Campbell book yet for our book club? Because we're heading into April now. The Creatures of the Pool. The Creatures of the Pool. Have you verified that it is, in fact, in print and available? I believe it is. So, in other words, you, <laughs> you have not. So, you have not. So, um, I like the face she got. You're just like, ah. if, if by verified you mean think, then yes. Hang on, I'm looking it up. Ramsey If you Campbell. mean by speculate. <laughs> if you mean speculate. Which is another big word. Then, yes. <laughs> creatures in God, the pool. I it's creatures of the pool. Creatures of the pool. Creatures of the pool. Wait a minute. Survey says. Wait a minute. Uh, Wait a minute. Uh, That's used. Used. Dude. It is not, in fact. This is pandemonium. <laughs> Fancy Campbell, what are you doing to me, man? <laughs> All right. You know what? I'm going to pick the ring. <laughs> That's it, I'm doing it. Um, doing it live. Here we go. We're doing, doing it live. Doing it live. I'm running this monkey lab now, Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alone with the Alone horrors. Alone with the horrors. I was going to pick that. That was my first book to pick, but I didn't think we could do short story collections. Why not? Why not? It's yeah. a book. Yeah. You're, it's your book. All right. Alone your with the pick. horrors. That was, like, was going to be the first one I was going to pick. All right. Alone. Mary has picked. <laughs> I have picked. I, I, I just, picked it. I just think Fine. we should keep arguing back and forth at higher octaves. With no input from any of us. I was going to put that book. You can pick it over the hairs of the world. You can do whatever you want. It's got a ball. I love it. That's a ball. I don't think I've ever heard you talk that way. That's, that's what he does to me in bed. That's what he does to you in bed. Hey, man. It's me, Elmo. Oh, God. Will you touch me in my happy place? Will you tickle me, man? Whatever you want, Elmo. Hi, <laughs> man. Slide over, man. It's your old pal party. Oh, <laughs> oh, I love you. <laughs> like, you're freaking me out, man. <laughs> right now in England. <laughs> Ramsey Campbell, who does, in fact, listen to the show. Not for long. <laughs> Not for long. I, I picture him out in the garden. Because yeah. they all have gardens yeah, there. Of course, of yeah. course. Having a spot of tea. Probably frowning at our ST Yoshi bit from earlier in the show. But, you know, mm. it's the kids. They do things like... <laughs> it's the kids. And they now we've, we've gotten to a threesome between Matt and Elmo and Barty the Dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone horribly okay. awry. Our next horror show book club selection for May will be... Alone with the Heart. Oh, I'm so excited. The great short fiction of Ramsey Campbell, 1961 to 1991. I am looking on Amazon right now. I've it is available it. brand new in Kindle mm -hmm. and in paperback and in hardcover. Mm -hmm. Sweet Jesus. It is awesome. So, it is awesome. I've read it twice. I'm going to read it again. Now, I have a copy out there in my office. Um, do I need to plan to lend that to you, Dandelion? Are you going to buy a copy? Yeah. Okay. Dave, do you have a copy at home? I think I do, but if I don't, I'll just get a copy. All right. And you listeners out there, of course, go buy a copy now as well. Let's start a run on that book and bump its sales like we do every time we do this. Yay. Awesome. All right. Are we done? Can I go pick up Dungeon Master Absolutely. School? Yeah, we're, All done. Right. yeah we're, yep. we're done. All right. Uh, before we go, once again, if there's something you want us to talk about, you got a news tip for us, hit us up uh, online. As always, we will keep you confidential if you ask us to. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, you may also enjoy Defenders Dialogue. That's a podcast I do every week with Christopher Golden where we talk about Bronze Age comic books. You may enjoy Cosmic Shenanigans. That's a podcast Mary does every week about cosmic horror. It is far more academic than this, and it is never 
ever narrated by an AI. Uh, you may enjoy Grindcast. That's a podcast Matt does every week about video games. It is, in fact, narrated by AI. And uh, you can tune in most nights to watch Dave live stream at twitch.tv slash meteor notes. Is that it? That is it. That's it. Bye. Bye. This is Jim Adams from Monster Attack. Hey, if you remember that monster movie from your childhood that got it all started for you, the one that really got you interested in monster movies, horror movies, sci-fis, and cult films, then you're going to want to listen every week to Monster Attack. We look at some of our favorite monster movies from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. With new episodes uploaded every Monday, it's Monster Attack. Exclusively on the Project Entertainment Network.